Welcome to Ausfilm Creatives, a podcast about Australian creatives working behind the camera. My name is Peter Sylvester and I'm your host. Welcome back, listeners. In today's episode, we have Mark Wareham. He's uh, quite an experienced uh, DP. He's done a lot of TV series, uh, most recently the last season of Preacher. Um, And he's also shot uh, several feature films, which we'll talk about. And um, one of my favorites of his work is Mystery Road. So let's uh, take a listen. Welcome to the show, Mark. Uh, it's wonderful to have you on Thanks, board, and, and um, I've really enjoyed some of your work, which we'll definitely talk about that I'd like to touch on. And I just want to know how you got involved into filmmaking and, and how you fell in love with it. Okay. Well, I was very fortunate that the school that I went to in the first, in the high school, and I wasn't a very good studio student, and I figured that I couldn't. The only other job I thought would be good to be like uh, a secret agent or something. I didn't think, or, or a rock star, and I didn't have the attribute for those two things. <laughs> and I was very fortunate that I had an English teacher that um, decided that she wanted to uh, introduce us to film and media. And so we, I went through at school the first uh, time, it was the first year, it was a test year of film and television as a subject so I did my it was one of my subjects for finishing school um it's quite interesting because out of that same school comes and out of my same class is another DP Ben not oh wow I went to the same school that's I cool same, so, so it's quite interesting and then there's a, you know there's older and younger and in the same thing but that Teacher then was uh, was very influential in um, showing that as a career because the guidance counselor at the school said, you know, living in Queensland, you'll never, there's no such thing as a career, you might have to be able to study advertising or do something else like that. So, I mean, so, you know, I was very lucky that when I left school, I studied at university, I studied uh, uh, at Griffith University when it first started again, it was like the first year because I, I, I got in because I won with another guy a uh, film competition and made a little film at school on Super 8. And um, I got into Griffith University and I studied humanities, but it was a film degree, but it wasn't like an arts degree. Like I would have been, I would have been better in an arts degree, but I didn't think of myself as I've been brought up in a very um, pragmatic household, so I didn't think of myself as having any artistic thing. I just thought, you know, I was a naughty boy. It was before you got um, uh, it was before you got uh, labelled with being having ADHD. So that's probably what I had, you know, as a kid. <laughs> but um, so I so I went and did Griffith Uni, of which I um, I was there only for six months. Uh, but while I was there, I, I the part that I did like. Apart from that, was that I liked the film screening. So we were fortunate enough to see a lot of films. So that was in 1981. Wow. And um, I then got a job in a production company for um, that was starting a business in Queensland. And um, I uh, was like basically got paid for three days a week to sort of let the tradesmen into the building and they were built like guest boards and a studio and hmm. – and stuff, and and um, you know, um, I worked at that company on and off for twelve years. Um, and I would say, so you know, from the time I was eighteen, probably through to, oh, you know, nearly thirty, when I started sort of thing. And while I was there, I, I um, initially I didn't think as filmmaking, I didn't think that I was going to be a DP because I didn't think I had the, I didn't think I had the, um, what's the word? Uh, you know, I was interested in the job, but I thought it was too, too, too hard. The, the, prior to this, a, 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 um, I'm jumping around here a bit, but prior to this, when I was a kid, my the house that we lived in had a product in it that was built by James Hardy, and they came and filmed a commercial there. And I remember looking at them filming this commercial, and these guys with long hair and tight jeans, and thinking, <laughs> "Shit, that looks like a good job." You know, so. <laughs> 
so if you if you ask about what you got attracted to those things, I mean, it's it's, it's funny how it works. But sometimes you just see something and think oh, that looks pretty good, you know. So then, um, as I say, because I was doing the thing at school, and then and, and they said, "Oh, you go and study it." Um, the uh, yeah. So in that in that in my in my degree, which I didn't finish, most of the people either became you know arts uh, administrators or and they've all you know. My friend, my collegial friends in that thing went down another sort of path, but it's just interesting that you know where you, where you sort of end up. But uh, that was my um, introduction, and you know, and I I just loved it. I loved the people, and I loved the the process, and I you know, and I liked the fact that you you know ended up shooting in places that you wouldn't normally go. I mean, a lot of the things that we did were you know corporate films about companies so you'd end up in a you know a, a, a iron smelter on a mine site or in a construction camp or, or somewhere where I'd never been exposed I suppose you know as a, as a sort of middle class kid growing up in Brisbane. You mentioned that you thought the job was a little bit full on to be a DP so how did you actually end up becoming a DP? Well it wasn't that when I, the guy that owned the company I worked for, well, he was a DP. And then I, well, as I watched him work, I, I, I really, because you know, because it was all film too, and so there was sort of a bit of a dark art there involved <laughs> in the lab and the printing and all that sort of stuff. Um, but I, I suppose I, I, my who is a DP got launched by him, and how he got me. Sort of shoot things would be he'd give me a hundred roll, hundred foot roll of of film and say, now you've got to go on. I want you to shoot something about the story bridge and come back. You have to. All you've got is that hundred foot load in the bolex. Mm. So that's so, like you that, know, that would have been like once three you minutes. start doing that. That's right, or two and a half, I think. Yeah, yeah. And so you really had to think about it. You know, talking about editing and camera, and of course you'd wait, to get it back, and all that stuff. And I suppose also I loved, I love machinery I, I don't know i just think I, I i i fell in love with all the gadgets you know all the <laughs> stuff that yeah. goes with it um you know down to everything like back then you know you used to use these things called six lights and just the whole thing of the technical technical stuff and anyway because he was a dp producer director i sort of ended up going down that path so i i then was, you know, doing these corporates and things, and then I actually got into commercial directing. So I was a commercial director in my mid twenties, mid to sort of twenties through to my later twenties. And then I wanted to meet with directors. You know, I, I felt that I had gone as far as I could, but then I wanted to be a DP. So I went on collaboration search I suppose you could call it so then I went and shot things on when Betacam first came out you know and stuff and shot the you know stuff with Molly Meldrum and <laughs> and uh you know some broadcast stuff and and my first DP job was on a show and the reason why I got hired is interesting I was shooting the location sh my first oh, sorry I'd shot a couple of short films and I'd shot a couple of little things but yeah, you know, I probably didn't really know what I was doing enough because I knew I knew how to shoot a commercial, yeah. but I didn't really. I was fascinated by drama and acting, and I did a couple of short films, like thirty minutes. I thought well, back then there were different sort of they would get funded these funded films that would be like the um, Australian Film Commission mm. AFC would fund these films, and you oh, go yeah. out and make a little period, you know, period film. And um, so the first one of those I shot was a thing called. Moments of cruelty. No, no, it wasn't moments of cruelty. It's called treadmill or ruby. And uh, then I shot a one called moments of cruelty, which I must look at. They were sixteen mil, um, super, you know, sixteen mil finish films with, mm. you know. And then, and then, um, so yeah, so then I went on a search to like try and find collaborators. So then I, I went and worked at the. I got a job at. Gold Coast, I was, I was living in Sydney as the location DP for a show called Paradise Beach, which was a soapy. Mm. And at that stage, I was in my late 
20s and I basically just shot location work for the studio stuff it was all multicam and in the second season because I looked at the studio lighting and thought oh, it's pretty <laughs> awful because it was all that thing so I got involved a bit in you know multicam uh studio lighting as well but I was very lucky that I was sort of mentored into that job by John Stokes ACS mm. John was a bit of a trail bait blazer up here and he 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 uh sort of I sort of shadowed him the first two weeks of the shoot and he and I'd say look oh the weather's no good are we going to do something else and he goes no nah, you just got to shoot the call sheet you know so <laughs> um look and, and I did that for about a year and a half and I, I have to say I learned so much it was like such a great boot camp in learning about you know blocking and how directors worked and i was very fortunate i worked with four very different directors um who uh you know i learned a lot from mm. and that thing but i you know i learned a lot about shooting stuff but not how to apply it to drama so so you know if you if i talk to you about how my my thing you know like most people i think you know, even the DPs that you see, I think you need to have a, a, a broad. I think you need to have an eclectic background to, mm. to be able to draw from because all, all that stuff helps you to deal with situations you come across. You know, definitely, yeah. That, that's one thing I always say that you know, it's it's good that if you come out of film school and you know all the techies, you know, and how you're supposed to make movies. But I think. Yeah, life experience is a is a very important part of filmmaking to make you, especially because you're dealing with so many people. It's not, you know, dealing with the camera. Well, work, that you know, that's easy. Well, yeah, I mean, and that's another thing you end up doing when you're doing those sort of corporate. When I was shooting those corporate films on sixteen mil, it'd be just be me sometimes, and I'd, you know, be sent to the states or something, and I'd have to go to a place, and I'd have to talk to people, and I'd have to you know, almost do my own production work and tee stuff up for myself because things would change on the road. So you wouldn't mm. want to come home with nothing. Mm. So you would you would you would end up um, you know, at night you'd be doing your camera sheets and so you were sort of a bit of a one man band. And but I think it, what they did teach you in that sense is it taught me how to deal with people and how to, you know, that management and of people was and mm. it's probably just as important as manage, managing resources and I think you know if you if someone said to me what about being a DP have you got better at and I think I think it's more that thing of just being much much more empathetic to how people's emotional state and getting the best out of people Taking into account that they could be tired or there could be something, you know, mm. you need to, you need to really, you know, your maturity, I think, as a DP sometimes um, comes to being, you know, just keeping yourself, keeping yourself cool, you know, keeping cool when everything goes to pieces, mm. you know? Definitely. Yeah, that's a big one I learned first on the first feature I did. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you really, well, especially, yeah, as, as you, probably would have experienced it in the earlier part of your career working on ultra low budget things and you'd still trying it like like the john stokes said you know uh, the weather's crap doesn't matter you have to keep shooting yeah yeah, yeah. you learn all that yeah, stuff. you just look for the thing yeah and he and he said to me you know he told me a couple of really good things and i and i'm always very thankful for john john for this because john sort of was a trailblazer he 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 came up in a similar sort of background. He was an in-house, he, he was an in-house camera person at, um, uh, in, you know, the in-house camera and with Brad. Him and Brad Shields were at a company called Jumbuck, and then they were at Zenac. And but John was amazing what he could do with digital, like the early. Oh no, when I say digital, like the early beta cams, mm. or not even before beta cam, like the one-inch cameras. I mean, some of the footage I used to see get out of these three chip cameras were just he just managed to coax his stuff out of it and mm. so you know the other part about that upbringing it's made me also learn that it doesn't matter what it is now yeah. it's all really good you know the cameras are all fantastic you know it's just it's just really how you manipulate them you know yeah and i i was kind and of you know having, what I, having a discussion with another dp a while back you know like 
if you had a choice of order of equipment you want to uh, shoot with if you've got say a low budget production you know i i, I kind of went actually these days i'd go lighting lens and then camera that would be my order yeah yeah, yeah. because yeah, yeah, at the end yeah. of the day, you can you can the, the cameras you can get now can capture amazing images you know i've got the little pocket you know black magic pocket camera but if you have crap lighting, like it doesn't matter if you're on an Alexa LF or, you know, a black magic. No, nah, that's right. So that's and all, all, all you're doing sometimes. All you're doing sometimes with going for more complex equipment is you're bogging yourself down. Sometimes. Yeah. You know, like I mean, I think they're beautiful, with sixty-five and the thing. But you know, there's a whole lot of other stuff that yes. you've got to trade out because all of a sudden they come to you and go, oh, by the way, the data we can't afford this. <laughs> the la la the la la the la la and you go well you know what i'd prefer to do it. yeah and i and i suppose that's the thing um you know we're probably i'll probably jump in ahead a bit but um um the you know i could talk to you about sometimes about deconstructing the job so you know like sometimes we talk about you know i know later we'll talk about why you take projects but even sometimes how I, i'll even like I did a film a few years ago where I basically just went back to very small crew and very little lighting and very simple, you know, a film mm. called uh, The Second, oh, yeah. which is on Stan. Yep. It's a Stan film. Okay. Yeah. But um, anyway, but, you know, but that was a, a really good experience because it was really deconstructed without the trucks and the gear and all that thing to try and go back to that sort of like short film making Thing that I did that I did like thirty years ago, but go back and apply the technology and you know what I know about how to cover th- you know how to do things to that yeah. that project. Yeah, well, I, you know, with those kind of projects, um, I haven't seen it yet, so I can't comment on it. But yeah, um, no. but the the thing is, with a lot of cameras today, they actually don't need you know they don't need too much stuff if you can produce a bit of quality light you know a couple of lights maybe three lights at most you know you can actually achieve pretty good work if, if you obviously if, totally. you, if you've got the experience and you know how to do it because that's what i mean like the camera the cameras these days will give you what what you need you can you're so many steps ahead like yeah i i learned on when i studied film you know i literally learned on film but that the all the early projects were all on beta cam sp you know and <clears throat> that one was a struggle mm. for me, like because I was, I was already quite heavily involved in digital color grading back then. Like I was on Avid, I was always manipulating the image, and yeah, when mm. I when I was getting the footage back from the beta cam SP, I was like, oh man, I got to learn to shoot better on that thing because it's horrible. <laughs> After sh- you yeah, know, yeah, learning there was, no, there was no, there was no, there was no log. It was all that Rec Seven Hundred Nine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was interesting. I, I, I when I first went to digital, one thing John tweaked me up to was actually getting into those cameras a bit and getting getting like a I, there was a guy called Stuart Shannon who was a, at Sony then and Stuart I'd say or Stuart, another guy called Stuart Wilson too as a tech and I'd say hey I need to adjust this camera and he'd pull the side off and get in the side <laughs> and I'd say he said what do you want and I'm telling him oh you know can you I just find it's a bit this a bit here and the highlights a bit sharp there and he's fucking around with it. <laughs> there, puts it ah, screw back on, gives it back to you and off you go and go, oh, that's good, you know. Um The old yeah, old way look, old um, school way of making a lot. <laughs> well, yeah, no, it was interesting. I that yeah, well we, that I that's an interesting one. I got into that quite early on, which was which was interesting. And I even even when I went across to the F nine hundred era Mm-hmm. I used to get them to bypass. I'd, I'd actually do a little cheat on those things. But anyway, that's another whole story. So I'd actually <laughs> shoot the log, get the log out of the camera before you, because I'd say you know they because they they came out with all that hyper gamma, you know that thing, and I'm going. I went to Peter Law as a Panavision actually and said, why, why I don't want to make a choice between this hyper gamma and that. And he goes, oh, why don't you just record the log in the camera? Like, well, can I? And he goes, yeah, mm-hmm. of course you can. Just bypass all that shit. Yeah, yeah. I'm like. No one told me that, you know, <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> yeah, you know, and then you, and then you know, and talk about black magic, but you know, their products like that, uh, I can't remember that one, that uh, box they had for monitors. Ah, oh, the mini decks, things. Uh, 
Well, I was a thing that you yeah. could put the signal in. You could yeah. hook your computer up to. You could have a little fiddle with, like, you know. I, I just got some because just in terms, of, I'm just posting. Um, I'm posting. Uh, we're posting the drover's wife, you know, Leah Purcell's film. Yeah. And I'm um, doing that as a, you know, remotely. And uh, I just got a whole lot of. I asked for some still frames to actually just get the Ari ball you know, yep. thing, and I just, because my, I've, because, because we've gone into sit, possibly six months, I've shut down all the, you know, subscriptions and all this stuff. Oh, yes, Cut yep. all this out, and some people might find this interesting. You know, I've gone into, like, I suppose, limp mode in the family to say, okay, well, you know, we can get through this if we just, yep. so, you know, so I, my wife, yep. I said, you got to drop the Adobe, the Adobe yeah, thing goes cloud, on the yep. Lightroom on the iPad. Yeah, yeah, and uh, well, because it's seventy nine dollars a month. Oh, it's right, expensive, you know, yeah. Like, yeah, and it's like all these subscriptions. I just think we've got this anyway. <laughs> I got the thing, and I just put it into. Uh, I couldn't get it on my iPad, so I got the PNGs up on the on the on the um, laptop. Show, yeah, so I guess on the laptop, my all that, which is not grunty enough to run anything. <laughs> um, but I was able to in preview just to. Play with the contrast, and it reminded me of that Black Magic box. Oh yes, whatever that thing, Deck Link or whatever. Deck Link, yeah, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. I only, I only thought about that this morning, but I thought, you know, and that was how I would get them. Because prior to that, there was a thing. Oh, that's another technical thing called that. The, that these colorists came up with called video aim density. I don't know. Did you ever know that? I I know about it, but uh, I didn't really research into it. So I don't. Yeah, well, it was a very simple system, and yeah. I, and and often when I go and um talk. To students about cinematography, I the biggest thing I love is testing. Mm. I still test for every job. I still do exposure tests on every job because I just think you need to know for your eye. It doesn't matter if you're shooting with the same camera. I just think you with the post houses is something I, I will always shoot an up and down test, and it goes back from shooting film for you know batch. But the video aim density was a very simple thing. Used to shoot a grey chart, and you would you would black a third of the screen. You would shoot the grey chart, and you would have the white. And the way the video aim density works is when they transferred your film, you'd expose that grey chart at your spot meter and what your incident would be, and that you knew that that was your full exposure on eighteen percent grey chart. Mm. And what they would do is then they would take that into the telecine and they would, because the telecine effectively was where log comes from because the neg would go up and the mm. neg would be really flat like that thing. And they would pull the pull the black down so it was just above black, you know, so mm. there was no colour and they'd take the colour out. They'd make the, and you would light it with what you would say would be your nominal 5,600 degree or 3,200 degree tungsten light. And in the white they would take to 90% on the chart and they yep. would run the thing and and then what they do they they would that would go one would go to your cut and copy and the other would go to your record whatever it'd be they'd be recording on after one inch of be beta digital beta cam or yeah, something, yeah. whatever whatever it was, you know, whatever the recording format. And it was a, a really good, simple, simple, simple system. And I mm. suppose that that still that system, I still apply that system right through to all the new cameras now. You know, I mean, the same concept of mm. where you're black, where you're white and where your grey is, and that becomes what, you know, what you talk, what you what you deal with. So, mm. yeah, but anyway, that jumped ahead a bit, but, you know. Well, well, the, well, the thing is, too, is that, you know, like in this remote world, like without, I've got no, like if I go historically, we'll go out of it. We're going to go out of this thing. If you go back to history and yeah. you look at things so you know the the world for people at the moment is make the most of the time to learn some things because you might not ever have this time again that's you know, uninterrupted yeah but at the same time it's um we should be working on how to remotely do things how to share ideas how to um how to work so that we can be involved in the grading, we can be, you know, we can still get our authorship onto stuff, mm. but we can still let other people do their work. But there's a way of having a dialogue and a discussion on on, on on how do these things work. And I think 
you know, it, it might mean that we don't we gain a bit more of home time if we find some ways of doing things. Mm. So yeah, so I'm I'm very open, and my I I would love from your point of view as a colorist, like what tools would would be great remote tools for us working in this environment. Mm. You know, with me working with a colorist is in a room in Sydney. Yeah, yeah. Apart from sending stills back and forward, I mean, I don't need to be there to see every because because I, I I sort of like to treat everyone I work with as a collaborator. So you know, I don't want to tell a colorist exactly how I want. I want to see sometimes what they come up with. You know, yes, like, oh, yeah, it's interesting. It's a bit like when they edit stuff together. People you go, oh, I didn't think you're going to use it like that, but that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Um. So you know, but you, there's a way to have a dialogue without sort of a, a really good back and forward dialogue that that we've got to learn to have, particularly in the time we're in at the moment, you know, that that, that what would be, um, without you physically grading it, what would be the, the uh, 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 some good tools to work, like we, we're, we're saying our Zoom works well for what we're doing. Yeah. Um, I did Messenger last night with someone. We did Zoom the other day for another research project someone was doing and um but you know they're quite limited really these tools you know oh, but yeah, it could no, be something yeah. yeah i worked with a storyboard artist and we did skype and he he we were chatting through the scene and i was just sending him frames and he was drawing it as we go and we're going, oh, that's great i'll move to get a plan it was all like wow this is actually really good mm. you know well, I mean, it's interesting. I just did a podcast with Alex Proyas and, you know, he's a huge advocate mm-hmm. right now about what do we do about the situation where, uh, you know, obviously yes. to do with this particular with, with uh, the coronavirus. But, um, but I mean, I, what you're talking about, I definitely agree because I guess I'm a huge advocate because I, whenever I do um, any sort of narrative work, I definitely... Mm insist on doing the grade myself with a assistant colorist because i because that that you know that's sort of my two you know my two passions i love color grading and like i said i've been doing it since 2000 you know and even in after effects when it took 20 minutes to render out you know 30 seconds but yes. i was already playing with that stuff so for me that's just embedded in my method of working but i think that's i guess my point was because i had shot on film and then, then I got stuck with, you know, high eight cameras and stuff like that. And, I, and ever since I learned on film and, and I shot my first, you know, two, three short film projects on film, um, I always pushed for this idea that, well, I'm trying to achieve, you know, that level of image, but I've got these crappy cameras. So what do I do about it? So, you know, that's when I really embedded myself in that idea of, color grading and, and understanding the digital format and how can I manipulate it to a level where the image quality is, you know, at a standard. And, you know, and like it, it was kind of like a, a, a nice thing when people said on, online when I'd post my videos from 2005 and they'd go, oh, what preset did you use? And I said, uh, no, that's, uh, that's me, you know, doing the color work. But um, mm. and so today mm. with, with DPs, I think that's a... You're charting it up. I think people... Yeah, like it's uh, t- with today's DPs, it's I-, I feel, you know, I feel like almost like a bit a bit of a pain for them because, like, like you said, you, you you don't end up having time to do that final process. And back in the day, I mean, luckily with you, if you've got camera time to do camera tests, that's awesome because you at least will get that pretty much the image that's going to be in the color grade. But sometimes, you know, you might be a very open ended DP where you know that in the post you want to play around quite a bit um but and that's that's yeah where... it's interesting uh, uh, there's an interesting point there though back in the days of work print and you always knew it was going to get better right yeah you know what i mean yeah yeah once it got a cuddle it was always going to but the problem with everyone now problem with editing and all that now is everyone expects everything to look like and it's on instagram you know it's yeah like, yeah so they they think if they watch something, they can, and this is something about shooting drama I learned, is you want to push it, you want to push it towards the direction you want to go yeah. a little bit because the problem is that people fall in love with it. 
Mm. And if they see it that way and it's embedded in their brain and you change it radically, they're going to mm. go, hang on, what have you done? Mm. Oh, mm. That, person's, that's, that, that person was wearing a red shirt, not a green one. It's like, or oh, whatever, you know. And, and I think you open yourself up for, and I, we all know that, you know, the colour grading and particularly if you're shooting raw in the cameras, mm. I mean, it's like... It's all on, you know what I mean? Mm. Like as far as in the colour grade, you can do whatever you like. But, mm. but, but the point about that is is whether you can because mm. someone goes and looks and goes, fuck, what have you done? Mm. I love that nice flat, <laughs> greeny flat. Uh, look, I remember seeing some ads that came on when the Alexa first came out and like, okay, I haven't even graded it. You know, it's like <laughs> the running blog. Yeah, yeah. You know, they the, the went for that real loggy sort of look, yeah, that yeah. loggy thing and I was going, what you know, be, you know, because obviously they just put it through, no one understood that you know, log C, and you'd see them go to air, and sometimes you'd think yep. it's like washed out. And and you know, there was almost a look where everyone said, Oh, we really love that look, you know. And I'm going, It's only because you've fallen in love, you know, that's yeah, that's how you got used to it. And yeah. uh, so you know, I think that that's something that we should be thinking, you know. I, I, that's why I like to test and mm. I even like to do the rushes. I even like to push the rushes out and say to everyone, all, all the investors, please look at it. Because mm. I said come out of that, one beautiful thing about working at the Gold Coast, uh, you know, coming up and doing most of my drama early on at the Gold Coast and working with Americans is I actually got to work the system. So going back and working with them like on Preacher and that was mm. like people were flipping out and I was going, no, nah, this is normal and actually these guys are great <laughs> yeah, yeah they're like oh but they're you know doing this and that and they want this and i said that's how they work but i you know they used to fight and people drop a hat i'd say to them you know australian directors go oh, don't worry about being out of focus you know just and i go well no on an american show you don't put up the out of focus yeah, yeah, shots yeah, no. just put out the shot because some poor focus puller there's no rehearsal they say i'll oh, just go for it they see <laughs> Five shots that are going in and out of focus. They all go, go fire the focus pool. And you yeah. go, well, hang on a second. But some director goes, oh, yeah, but I like to use those bits and this and that. And it's like, I, I think we've got very blase about all that stuff. Mm. And as much as I love all that, I love all that craziness, you also do, you know, it's a thing of like, know the rules to break the rules. And it's good to be able to do that. But at the same time, just be very aware because attention spans, like I can tell you, I put two hours of dailies up. No one's mm. going to watch them all. Mm. What's going to be happening? They're doing this. I might look over and look, fuck, what's that? I can't see their face. I'm mm. a bit, hang on, fuck. That's a bit dark. Bring it you know, up, and all bring of a sudden they're all, well, <laughs> yeah, well, no, well, they're, well, they're saying it didn't lit, it's under lit. And yeah. this, you know, so I'm just saying we've got to be, that's why, you know, when you do all that stuff, and it's really, really important to be thinking about that stuff up front mm. and knowing that you can manipulate stuff, you know, like I know because I know what's, you know, and even the grading that I will use, if I there's something that I know that I can shade down a wall or something in the grade mm. and that's going to take me another half an hour to do it on time, well, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I'll weigh up what's going to be the quicker thing. Yeah. I think the other thing we've also got carried away with is like, you know, reliance on digital stuff, taking stuff out. You know, yeah, like yeah, like, yeah. You know, and just this, but it all has a cost, you know. Like, oh, yes. Uh, you yeah. know, and so I think I think sometimes, you know, I think we've all gone a bit silly. If you want to sit down, I remember when um, Red, the Red first came out and I had, you know, um, you know, editors say, oh, why don't you shoot on the red? You can do all, you don't need this person, you don't need that person and all this. And I said, well, who's going to stay up all night and do the transcoding between the thing? Yeah. Are you going to do it? Because I'm not going to do it. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't, I'm gonna, I want to go go home after a 12-hour day and have a sleep, you know? Yeah. So, so um, yeah, so it's that, it, it, we're in an interesting thing that I think um, I love all the stuff that all the new stuff does but in a yeah. funny sort of way I, I actually still try to get it as bright as i can in the camera mm. you know if i you know if i can and especially now hdr i mean this is another I'm just, oh geez yeah I, I got warned about that two years ago when i was mm. over doing over at park road post and we were talking about 4k and they got the 
got colour said to me, oh, you should get the technical guy in. He'll tell you about HDR. And I came back and I was saying, HDR this, HDR that. Like when I was 16, 16 by 9, I'm saying, what's your 16 by 9? They're going, why? I said, because that's going to be the widescreen format. And they're mm. going, oh, that. But she'd super 16 instead of 16 and protect mm. for it, you know. Mm. Or HDR, you know, now everyone's going, oh, fuck, it's HDR. And mm. it's like it's completely different, you know. You get a shock when you first, first time you walk in there, it's tweeting, it's mm. in the grading suite. I mean, holy fuck, you know, the highlights and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And you see some HDR stuff looks terrible yeah, because yeah. they haven't shot it for HDR. No, no. I mean, it's tricky. The, you know, the, so, the, the HDR thing is tricky. As I, I'm a, I guess I'm, you know, a huge fan of like Caravaggio kind of paintings, right? So that there's a lot of negative, you know, black, in no information, kind of image. Like I, I, that's sort of what I love. Not that I would do. Yeah, that. I like. I like. I like it. That's what I say when so, people have the purple thing up in the, on the false color i mean that's one thing i don't use is false color yeah i just say take that fucking shit out of the monitor <laughs> it's a monitoring fucking measurement it's not yeah, a, yeah it's not a it's not a it's not a you know a scientific fucking that's right it's like shoot, shoot for the image so that's the only thing i'm like i love hdr if you're if if you're shooting for it like if you're going you know what yeah. i really this image is about creating that i can see the outside of that house and every bit of exposure but just as much that in the let's say a scene out of i don't know a godfather let's say you know completely dark inside but you see the outside oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like but yeah, yeah. okay cool but but otherwise like having this obsession of seeing everything that's that's the my only little sort of concern that it takes it takes me back to the old video it's sort of like the old what the old TDs, video engineers were, you know, you weren't allowed to blow anything out. And mm. the first thing I, you know, in the, I remember the video days, they'd say, I oh, set your clip and say, no, you're not clicking anything. Mm. Well, the first thing I'd do is go, I can't have a barge window there. I mean, <laughs> or something. Because you know, it's all ugly out there, or, you know. Yeah, yeah. Or I even directly say, oh, the flux is on. I'd say, oh, I didn't get time to dress that corner, make it dark, or, or you know, and it's like you rely on that. Contrast, yeah, yeah. As DP, I think, and as filmmakers, I think where you show the frame is really important. And we're getting all these other things. And I mean, it, it, you know, I suppose we're jumping ahead to where this is all going. But I, I think you've got to have a a big. You've got to be technically aware of all this stuff. At the same mm. time, I would say that the only big thing with HDR is I just think you should HDR grade. If you're going to do HCA, yeah. HCA grade from the start, and yes. then and then do your your non HCR pass separately, because if you go and apply, I know there's a few jobs lately where they've applied the HCR pass after they've graded it like a plug in, and oh yeah, shit out. Oh. <laughs> bad idea. Because they're just like it just yeah, it's, it's like an auto grade thing. Yeah, yeah, you can't yeah. do that. No. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and and also it's weird that if you think about it, like you know, talking about Peter Cam, I mean, Rec 709. I mean, Rec 709 is as old as the, you know, it's it's back to when TVs, you know, had record players in it. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. well, almost, you know. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It's such an art, it's, it's such a shit, you know, form, it's such a shit standard. Yeah. And we still mostly, you know, and, and that's why I said to people, well, they're using Rec 709 LUTs, and I'm going, well, no. The fucking iPad's not even a Rec 709. Or yeah, my, yeah. you know, my Mac, this MacBook Air that's probably six, seven years old. Not well, the, the new, um, I, I think the the new iPad, the latest one, is rated at 2020. I think. So is it? It's I, th- I knew I think, they were good. They worked all right in P3. Yeah, I, I'm um, not sure. And that's you know, don't quote me on that. But yeah, I, I believe the the latest version that they were bringing out was going to be 2020 quality standard. So. I don't know if that's the case still, oh, but right. but you know what I mean. Like you're right. Like the screens are, are different, and yeah, the Rector Seven and like I I never I kind of when when I grade I grade from log. Like I don't go oh I'll put the Rector Seven O Nine you know gamma into it and right, stuff. And then go, no, no, no. Like well, I would, you might you put an Asus, you might put an Asus light or something very mild on to it. Yeah, or something. Just, so yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess the the question you pose at the start about maybe some tools I, I think these days with i mean with da vinci 
if you learn some of the basics, it's actually very easy to do remote grading now because there's shared project options and and I think just learning like you know like as a as a good DP you you don't need to fill around too much to get the image you know you've got you, you could use just the, even the curves if you did but you've got the three wheels you know yes. and you just have them and off you go and you can send that project back to the colorist and go this is roughly what I'm looking after so you can actually do it quite easily like at the moment I've, I've well even uh, for Legend of Ben Hall, I graded it at home and then went to, to do yeah. a finish two weeks in Sound Firm. Um, but like currently we're, we're, I'm doing a short film that I shot, same thing, you know, the, the editor sent me the project file um, so I can just start, you know, I've got the correct edit. I don't have to do any conforming, any of that stuff. I mean, yeah, I can remove the audio and all that if I want to, but you don't really need to if you're familiar with the program. But in a case of a DP where they don't want to have to deal with that yet, they could just send a flat, you know, simple cut um, edit to you um, or even like the stills of each one and you can just apply the, you know, where the, that's what, that's what the master, master yeah, frame. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. So I always go, send me, send, me the, send me the, you know, like the hero part of that shot and give you a pass on it and you can just send that back and it's already on the timeline you know even if it's just a static image so i think yeah, yeah. i think we're actually not too far and like like you said you can use zoom and that to have a quick meeting with the the colorist and i think yeah cuz that, that's one thing for me I, I i do still believe that you do have to protect that image that you intended to create you know like totally as a dp totally. you totally and i you you find so many dps that say oh you know and that just devastated yeah they go and pick these lenses with character and all that and, you know the thing is that you effectively you can grade a lot of that stuff out if you want to you know what i mean like mm. you know um yeah you've got you've got to be a bit, you've got to be really careful i've had it happen thing um yeah i um i back when i worked at that in-house at that production company we had an edit suite in the house and we ended up buying a thing it was an inline thing downstream because you know then you everything you know, you came off, you'd have like three playback machines and a record machine, you know, so you could do A, a and B roll on all yeah, that. Yeah. But um, we used to have a mixer and we had a thing called NATO. And what I used to do, this is like before Da Vinci and all that, because the only, they you know, had plugins, but they didn't have Windows. I remember when Windows oh, first yes. came out, but I used to do them before that. Because what I used to do is we had this thing called a Cox color corrector and it had like four pots. Yeah. And you could just basically take the, it was an inline downstream color corrector yeah play with the highlights and twist the color you know pop. and then what i used to do is i used to key the skies out and mm. rekey them rekey another thing or i'd do another pass yeah and i'd a and b roll it on top of each other anyway Just it was pretty you know but but and i even we it was it funny i remember the first time i did i did this speed ramping and everyone's going what are you doing that looks so stupid and then <laughs> everyone's doing yeah, it yeah a few years later it came in you know anyway because like they said, how are you going to cut this in? It's not going to fit. And I said, why don't we just speed it up? And then, yeah. you know, go back. To it. So anyway, you know, but anyway, it was it was funny. But we were playing around with those ideas. So, you know, what to do that stuff that I can do, you know, on a laptop now yeah. is just incredible. Oh, it is. You know? And it's getting there. And I think if yeah. you can work with the, um, the colorist that way, in a remote way, as a DP, as long as you've got the time, and you know, a lot of times you sit in for for a week or something, um, that you know that obviously helps. And if you, you know, yeah, I used to, I, yeah, I, I used to like the way. Sorry to jump in there, yeah. but the way you used to grade film, because I, I felt you didn't obsess on the frames quite as mm. much. You'd sit in and you you'd go through and they, they you just notch it up on the color master and then you would send it off and they print it. Mm. And then you'd sit there and you'd watch the first print come through and you couldn't stop it. Mm. But you'd just write your little notes and then yep. the end you'd go, oh, that shot there was a bit – because you'd see it in the run and go, thing. And I find a funny sort of way – I said to him, I think that's how we should approach this a bit more like film grade, real little time. Mm. And and I could even – you could even send me a DCP or something. I could go and find a cinema that I could – of a reel and go and watch it, you know, yeah. projected. Because yeah. I also think that gives you a different – perspective too sometimes you know oh yeah it's 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 actually a, a real blessing like when i did the feature film i you know in sound firm that was i, I graded on on their projector one 
and it's just like even though I'd be I've just, spent, I've just spent a month doing it at home and you know I, I obviously my equipment wasn't quite calibrated you, you can get dial it in pretty close at, at home just with your equipment of as long as you know you spend a bit of money on it but you don't need to go spend stupid money like a, get a Flanders you know HDR $30,000 monitor no. Uh, you can, no. I mean, these t- these days you can buy a TV that's actually got um, Dolby uh, Dolby Vision approved approved uh, HDR ten plus for two grand, and mm. and you'll you'll How much? for about two grand, you know, between two yeah, and three right. grand you can get a a, a fifty five to seventy or sixty inch like Panasonic or a Sony or something that gives you that that image, and you'll you'll actually dial it in pretty close, like. Yeah, it's not going to be as exact. And I, I remember when I went into Sound Firm, did it? It was only the contrast was just slightly off. That's all. So my adjustments were very minimal when I went in and saw it on the big projector, you know, massive screen. But yeah, yeah it was a contrast pass more than anything else. Yeah. yeah, and everything else. The color was pretty much on it. I didn't have to adjust anything in color. And but yeah, having that large screen is a huge help. Like you do. Well, you see your mistakes as well, but also you realize, oh, okay, maybe I pushed it too far there. Yeah, but it's yeah, but this is the thing we've we've lost a lot of those big. I mean, sound firms probably the last of them. Mm. You know, but you know when you go and mix too, you know they're like the big. I don't know if you ever did a mix in that uh, stage one there over the Lux hat. No, but you know, it, it's the same sort of thing. You can go and pre mix all you like, but when you do that final thing, I think you, you know you really do want to be in a sim because I I've got to say when you go and see one of your films. Mm. Like at a film festival in a two thousand seat cinema somewhere or something, you know, mm. you really do feel like you're staying. You know, that dream that you have where you've, you've gone to school and you've got your pajama pants on. You know, it's <laughs> like, yeah, you know, you, you do. It's a different, so different. Yeah, you know? it's fantastic. So, yeah, it's uh, so different. But um, yeah, but anyway, you know, I'm um, yeah, no, I think. It's interesting we're navigating this, and as I was talking to Timmy at BMAC the other day, and he was saying, oh, it's a good time for you to catch up on all of the technical things that are coming up with, you know, lighting and mm. the, all the stuff, you know. Yeah. But I try not to get too obsessed with it because no. I, I find that it burns too much. It, you need to know about it, but it burns too much of your time on set. I mean, you know, like a lot of people say, talk about um, – you know, on set colouring and all that stuff. And I go, look, that's great on certain projects. <laughs> but all the things I do, they're like 25 day shoots or 20 day shoots or something. Yeah, yeah. You better got time to, if you want, and most directors are more interested in coverage and they'll, yeah. they'll just want to get the coverage they want to get. You mm-hmm. know? So, um, and I understand their point of view too, that what they want is they, they need the stuff for their edit and all that stuff. Mm. But, you know, because we are in this digital world now, there's no, there's no like, oh, we're breaking a ratio or any of that sort of stuff. Like, yeah, but I think that's still... Hang like, on. Uh, well, that's an interesting discussion. And I, actually, I'll ask you that question with this next section where we'll, I want to talk to you about Mystery Road, you know, making that. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, I saw the uh, both films, but the Mystery Mystery Road and then uh, what was the follow-up film called? Uh, Goldstone. Oh, Goldstone. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I, I'm interested in your, your approach and, and references with the, um, as far as the look that you guys decide to go with, because obviously you probably wanted to continue that, have some continuation from the movie, but, very, yeah. Very much so. Yeah, talk about that. Well, I will. Um, it was interesting on Mystery Road because I've never – the ironic thing is Ivan Sen, who I think is amazing, probably – I probably live as close to him as anyone else does. He lives like probably about five kilometres away and I've never actually met Ivan in person. <laughs> and I've sort of wanted to. But um, I very much at the start of Mystery Road wanted to homage to his film. Yeah. Because obviously Rachel's a very different director to Ivan is. Mm. But I very much did. And one of the things that he did is he shot those films on red. Mm. Cause he, and he shoots and directs and, you know. Yeah, yeah. And the reason why he said he wanted to shoot red, the Jowsy told me, was he, he loved the sharpness of it. Mm. That he loved the, the clarity that he got. And he also used Master Prime. 
which mm. are, you know, sharp lenses. Mm. So on Mystery Road, I actually thought, well, why don't I shoot red, mm. you know, for a different. So I shot with a helium. Oh, yes. Now, yeah, and uh, and look, there's things about it that I didn't like because I suppose that there's, when I say didn't like, just in a menu, it's more menu, it's oh, more yeah, red menus. language, yeah, it's yeah, more yeah. known the syntax of languages, and it's before yeah. they come out with that IPP2 thing, which I think is, is it IPP2? Yep, yep, IPP2, yep. Yep, yep. yep. yeah, one. that wasn't there, we were still using, and I was getting, and I only got the first two weeks we were putting the metadata down wrong and all that stuff. But, um, you know, they wanted to shoot, hit the 4K standard. Yeah. And they wanted to uh, and do that. So I probably, in hindsight, didn't do as not enough testing on that camera, more for the post path. But, look, in the end it was all fine. Mm. But um, I have to say, if you ask me again tomorrow, would I use that camera again, I'd go, yeah, I probably would. Because mm. I did think it did give it that. When I look at Mr. Road, he sort of desatted it more. Rachel likes a bit more colour punch mm. yeah, yeah. in the thing. But basically, you're shooting a raw image, mm. you know. And with the, what everyone says about reds, I mean, I'm probably not as comfortable with them, but I, I ended up shooting last year with the DXL2 oh, Panavision, yes. yep. you know. Wow. Fucking awesome camera. <laughs> you know, I don't like, there's things about it I don't like, you know, physically and stuff. But, I mean, talk about a game, bottom end, you know, wh- whatever Panavision done with their colour science on that camera. Mm. Um, but, but yeah, look, um, you know, I, ha- I had to wrestle with the thing a bit to work out how to get an image out onto a monitor that looked okay because mm. we, just, we, just weren't a, we just weren't red. Usually, yeah. Which is, you know, red's always been something that people are sort of own operator thing. Mm. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's parts about those cameras that are really good to use. So anyway, I um, so we used the red helium, which was the 35 mil sensor. Yeah. At six k, which, which was great because. I shot about seven two so, or yeah, so, something. Oh yeah, yeah. Or I would have probably. Sh- so I shot it at whatever the thirty-five mil because it's actually it's actually helium's actually bigger than super thirty-five. Yes, yes, yeah. But so because uh, about well, we shot it at so we all got the rough lens size. You know, in the hindsight, I probably would have just done a monster and shot it at five k and yep. the same thing. You know what I mean? Mm. Maybe that's what I do now. But look, apart from some overheating and that whole thing at the start, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah. You know, Aries are, Aries are probably a more reliable camera and a better build, mm. you know. But, look, it was, it's sometimes good to mix it up. I mean, I, I've done things. I'll, 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 you know, I'll, I, I'm pretty open-minded on cameras, um, you know. On th- you know, mm. like I've just about used them all. And, um, you know, I think they're all really, they've all got really good things. But anyway, so visual approach. So, yeah, we started with that. But because we were in the Kimberleys and not in Queensland, mm. I started getting quite affected by, um, A, the local artwork, but also it's got a pretty interesting look up there. And uh, another thing that um, Ivan used a lot of was, he, you know, he was played around with a lot of drone stuff, which yes. sort of so we did as well. And... Um, and I started using a drone for wrecking only because the areas were so big mm. that you would use that for thing. And then the other thing I did is, um, you know, that time lapse sequence was opening to start. Mm. We did a lot of tests, and then we got, I got Murray Fredericks to shoot that. So Murray came and did that time lapse, which was a design, and which has no visual effects in it at all in camera, yeah. you know, cam block and stuff. But we, but we ended up doing a lot. I was going through. We did a lot of photography because people ask me how did you react to those race focus i had quite a long pre-production on that one um because the script there was a little bit of a pushback because the script wasn't written for up there so okay and around and rachel had a very clear idea of how she wanted to paint that picture of the ballantine station and the town and all that stuff which you know you know meant that we were sort of over an area of about 400 kilometers apart you know well <laughs> put those things together. Um, yeah, but, I mean, um, Rachel has a very um, 
specific view about how she likes to uh, cover things. And um, at the same time, she also is um, quite, um, quite uh, you know, collegial as well, you know. Nothing, and, and having had worked with Rachel, um, you know, before, you know, like I, I've probably that was probably my fourth job with Rachel. So, you know, that it's good when you like, I like working with direct, I like working with new directors, but I enjoy working with directors I, you know, work with before. I tend to, most directors I work with, I work with them more than once, you know. Yeah, yeah. Which is um, something because some people that, that does not doesn't go the same for everyone, you know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, you develop a bit of a um, rapport, shorthand, and things like that, and and understanding like. of of their style. So, but you know, you've you've still um, it's one of those things that um, they can still surprise you, though. <laughs> yeah, I know that. I know for sure, and that's the nature of the beast, you yeah. know. That, and that, that, no, I suppose sometimes that's they are the things that keep the days interesting, you yeah. know. You'll yeah. get the curveball. So you know, and I was I was having a chat about Misty Road to someone else because they were more talking about the more project about shooting location, but um, you know, what if you look at that was a ten week shoot, I think. So that's sixty days. I think it was a sixty day wow. shoot. No, no, that wasn't six, it was 50. Wow. The 50-day shoot, right? But there was probably three weeks of interiors in there. Mm. But what was the lucky thing is the last two weeks were meant to be thing. We were still going out in the afternoons and shooting because there was a lot of times a day that it looked better up there than worse. But the thing mm. is you don't have, even on a 50-day shoot, six hours. So 50 days. Is that? Ten weeks, like yeah, it was fifty. It was fifty days. It might have been forty nine, but it was fifty. So, if you do the mass, you, you can't with a turnaround with Judy Davis and wearing a wig and mm. stuff. You can't really get too much morning stuff because you just can't make the turnaround. Oh yeah. yeah. So you really you're, you're really stuck on afternoon light. So if you take out say three weeks, you're taking fifteen days. So you end up with forty five, basically forty five hours and end worth of stuff. Now, if you mm. had your way, you'd shoot it all. You'd shoot it all in those sort of – it was about 3 o'clock till 6 o'clock was when, you know, it was when it got nice, you know. Mm. Mm. It sort of was – even though we were quite – we were in winter, we were sort of at the end of winter coming to summer, mm. which is – you're a long way north there. You're almost – you know, you're – it's – wouldn't say it's not quite the very top of Australia, but Kanana is the top of it's the very top of Western Australia. So mm. the only way you get the light over at all is, is is then and also the way Judy was wearing that dark outfit and the mm. hat. So there was a lot of things that ended up being more practical. Yeah. Yeah. Things. And the car the car rigs like if I sent you a photo of like we'd put build like a twelve by twelve Ne- negative over the top of the whole car. Yeah. Put the cameras underneath, so take the reflection out, but also to keep the cameras cool. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> so it became practical. But just up there, if you put, you couldn't even touch. You couldn't even touch the tripod. Sometimes it was so hot. Wow. You know? yeah. it, from the sun, just the radiated heat. Yeah. But um, but at the same time, you know, the crew was really good, and I'd work work with the gaffer and the grip. I did. I've done three other jobs with them. So, camera department were all guys. I guys and girls I'd worked with before who were great, you know. Yeah. So um it was a good uh it was uh you know a good team and a really enjoyable project and one that I'm very proud of mm, and uh um um you know also you know just being getting permission to go to those um you know by the traditional owners to go to some of those sites to, you know I always made sure that I respected them and would always ask them, was it okay if I put a drone up or was yeah. it all right, you know, how yeah. they felt about this or that. So, you know, working, you know, you've got to sort of uh, be a little bit of a diplomat as well in those situations Oh, yes, as well. definitely, yeah. So, yeah, when I lived yeah, up so, in, uh, um, I lived up in, before we moved down to Brisbane, lived up in central Queensland, so 
did get to do a oh, little, right. little bit of indigenous kind of work and you you know you really start to um well i mean empathize but also you understand it a bit better as well the the, the culture because you you're yeah. much more close yeah. to it and you know like for me i'm an immigrant so i don't actually have a i guess any you know preconceptions about the you know the aboriginal indigenous culture because to me i'm i've come to their land or i've come to australia so i'm respectful of everyone that's in, allowed me here you know what i mean so i don't but it's mm. hard for someone who's born in the country and not and not have that um uh, how would you say almost entitlement because i'm i'm australian i was born here kind of thing um and you don't get that perspective so well that you're actually on someone else's land so no, it was really good, no, and, and, it's a be- sure. and it's a beautiful culture. Like I, I love their, you know, their their approach to storytelling and and the ideas they have, and they live in that kind of world. Uh, it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, so. totally. And, and and their relationship to country, you know, the relationship to country, and also you know the the respectfulness of the elders, mm. you know, which is something that I don't think we, you know. Acknowledge my respectfulness of elders, and yeah. you know the the um, you know the the knowledge and that that gets passed down. Um, I think some you know I almost feel like for young in our society now, you know, you're watching young men and to some extent women, you know, mature. Mm. You know, without sort of religion or culture. Or if you think about any of those strict cultures, you know, it's fine to say that we're in this world of neoliberalism where, you know, everyone just whatever. Mm. But, you know, there's without without that some sort of law or structure or something. Mm. Discipline is you what You realise that everyone loses their way. Yeah, everyone loses their way a bit, mm. you know, and, and I'm even to the point where you're just saying navigating your way through, you know, in, getting into this film industry, you know, you, you do rely on people like, you know, someone who's also been influential in my career has been Ron Johansson because you know mm. he was he was a he was a commercial director EP when I first started, and uh, Dick Marks was another one, and and they were always you know had, had comments of not only praise but also if they saw something they didn't like they would actually say what are you doing where mm. like what what was what were you, what were you thinking <laughs> you know but so you know but but i think the problem in this day and age is that no one really gets that feedback and everyone gets quite hurt if they get anything negative yeah, from them as yeah, well yeah and um and i think that you know sometimes and i think people beat themselves up about they don't want to make mistakes but i yep. mean you know you, what you've got to be able to do is learn from those but i what i do love it about you know the indigenous culture is that that you know that in in they've still got a culture that has a respect there's a there's a you know a, a transition but particularly for men to menhood there's women you know women have their women's business that they mm. are able to share with women and I think that we should be encouraging that culture, and obviously that's their culture, not mm. ours. But at the same time, our collective, the collective culture, as Rachel talks about, of the Australians coming from immigrants from overseas, you know, the influx is. I always think the great influx of, you know, the, you know, you know, Asian and Chinese culture. We we're having this thing about the Chinese, but you know, Chinese have been in Australia for as long as the. Yeah, they've been here as long as the, the English. white guys. And yeah. if you believe, if you, well, if you believe, if you believe, um, the uh, what's that book, 1492 or whatever, you know, they were here, they were here a lot longer and were interacting with indigenous, the Dutch, the Portuguese. I mean, we we've got this this weird sort of thing that we, as and I, as I went to school, that we believe that you know Australia started in. 1770 or you mm. know whenever that was the beginning when, when we actually got this amazing history that goes mm. back in time and 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 not only not only the indigenous but the indigenous were interacting with other people for three or four hundred years before yes you know yeah. the english and so you know and so you know australia has this collective culture that i think you know we've we we you know we the best thing we could do do would be to embrace it and respect it and 
and also to, you know, be proud of it, you know. Yeah. And I think, yeah. um, and, you know, if you think also to the, the one of the big successes, particularly in the last 10 years, I think, in the Australian film industry, is if you look at the successes of the Indigenous filmmakers mm. and everyone can say, well, they are the ones, you know, on the world stage who have had something to stay and have very much cut through, like, you know, Warwick Thornton, who's, I can't wait to see the, the next Mystery Road series because mm. Warwick River and Wayne Blair have done that. So, and Wayne was in the first one. Yeah. Um, you know, and they've, they've, they've collaborated before, but that's a great collaboration. Mm. Just put it in another direction. You know, Rachel, Ivan Sen, you know, mm. what a, what a, filmmaker mm. you know um so you know the most exciting our most exciting filmmakers have been indigenous but and if everyone says well why is that well, there's two reasons one is they have something to say mm. which i think as an australian we we've lost it we we've not lost it but we we don't have as much to say about things mm. and i think uh and the second thing is you know the Indigenous Department of the Australian Film Commission and then Screen Australia and then having an Indigenous Department of the ABC. And so I think, you know, Sully Riley and their support that they gave those directors, uh, those those filmmakers, has been really f important to let them say those things and that investment has paid itself off so much. And that and that, that is something that we only worry that we're going to come out of this thing in the, you know, the this coronavirus is, is that they built this very, very rich culture. I hope that that support, that after we finish that, that we're able to support all filmmakers the same sort of way, you know, mm, mm. and to tell that collective story, to, to tell that collective story. So, you know, and, I, and I'm very lucky that, you know, I've just done The Drover's Wife with Leah and it's, you know, without no spoiler there, mm. it's quite an amazing, uh, you know, retelling. It's a revisionist Western, you know, okay. 18, 1890s, um, you know, based on the Henry Lawson short story. Mm. But, you know, then she made a play. Mm. So it's, you know, high country Australia, um you know about a about you know, and it's a film about domestic violence, but it's not about, and it's a film about um, people discovering their culture, you know, and discovering mm. where they come from and the secret. And you know, to some extent, I can relate to that because my family, actually, my mother's side of my, she comes from Fiji, and so back in her family, there's a very similar sort of story to the driver's wife story where. You know, you believe the sort of Anglo upbringing, but of course, there's always some sort of, you know, thing that gets covered up. You know, mm, a, a mm. thing it covers up over time. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that we all, you know, we all, we all forget that, you know, that the we're all migrants in Australia. Really. Yes, exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so we're not. You know, I think we can be. And, and, and then again, you know, like that's what I was saying, you look at all the other filmmakers who have come here uh, have really interesting stories to tell, you know. Mm. So um, anyway, I think, um, you know, I feel very, I feel very um, blessed to have um, worked with all those, just about all those um, Indigenous filmmakers. And, you know, the first, my first real mainstream one was Red Fern Now that I did, yeah. that I got to work with. You know, and some of them I've worked with Leah before that. I've shot short films for her as well. Her Leah's partner Bain lived with my brother in Brisbane mm. like twenty five years ago. So you know, <laughs> I've got a very and you know, when my brother said, "Oh, Bain's dating this really clever young girl Leah who sings and does all these things," and, and then I ended up working with Leah as an actor mm. away, you know, and then. Rachel was married to a friend of mine, but we weren't actually really until we worked together. We sort of bonded, and then we did um, we did Redfern now, and we did Jasper Jones, and then mm. Street Road. So, so you know, so that's um, you know nice to be able to collaborate with uh, filmmakers like that.
So we'll wrap up there, but uh, we'll continue next week with part two and we'll discuss uh, more of uh, Mystery Road and also Don't Tell, which is another feature film, and talk about the industry. So please make sure to listen in next week. Mm-hmm.